crouch. Peek. Peek, 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 shoot. Peek, peek, shoot, 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 shoot. Peek, peek, peek. Peek, shoot, shoot, shoot. Peek, peek, peek. Crouch. Crouch. Peek, peek, shoot, shoot. Peek, 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 peek. Game one. Is that a good summary? It's like, yeah, that's like every Siege game of my life right there. Hey everybody, welcome back to Multiplayer Vault, brought to you by Baritone Studios. I'm Sky. And I'm Evan. And today we're going to be talking about the lore of Rainbow Six Siege. So Evan, do you want to start with, with sort of your experiences with the game? You and I have a decent amount of experience, right? Yeah, and so like I've mentioned in uh, several other episodes that, you know, we've Sky and I and others have played lots of games together, and Siege was one that we always circulated back to in our, you know, yearly gaming rotations. We haven't touched it for a while now, but uh, yeah, we used to play a lot of it, and I was always garbage, but it was fun kind of reading all of the operators' backgrounds because they are all from, you know, around the world. Well, you played it, like, really recently, like you played it earlier today, right? Yeah, I did. I played it about two hours ago, and I won a 1v4 with Blackbeard. Um, I was very proud of that because I almost never do well, so I was very happy. Nice. Yeah, I haven't I haven't played this game in like a year. Last time I played it, it was like the beginning of year six or something. And when we started to really get into it, it was like end of year five. So like 2020, it was like during the, the Splinter Cell season or whatever, we got Sam Fisher. And uh, I mean that was that was cool. If you thought that the Fortnite seasons and stuff were crazy, it's me, Joel McHale. <laughs> Rainbow's a whole another level. Yeah, yeah. And then they started not releasing any new maps and only one operator a season. But whatever. Anyway, um, and with that, let's go ahead and jump into this episode's research. So, what's a NATO to do when international terrorism is at an all-time high because of the end of the Cold War? To start a secret multinational counter-terrorist organization, of course. Duh. Sheesh, who does this guy think he is asking a stupid question like that? That guy being me, who asked that question. I don't know. Anyways, we don't actually start this story at the beginning of this mystery anti-terrorist unit. The story truly begins in 1949 when our Rainbow Six dad, John Clark, is born. Daddy Clark. <laughs> born John Terrence Kelly. The poor boy's mom dies of cancer, and a decade or so later, he joins the U.S. military, becoming a U.S. Navy SEAL just in time for the Vietnam War to start. It's there that he and other SEALs carry out several successful missions that eventually lead to him being offered a position in the CIA's Special Activities Division. John becomes a cool secret agent type that becomes involved in various international incidents such as the Iranian hostage crisis. In the 80s, his wife is killed by a drug gang operating out of Baltimore, so he goes all John Wick on him and kills all 16 involved in his wife's murder. But the Baltimore police doesn't like that Kelly killed over a dozen people without due process and all that jazz. What a bunch of squares. I mean, come on. Boo. Kelly is able to escape the grasp of the BPD with the help of an admiral friend of his, and he fakes his own death and changes his name to John Clark. So John Kelly did a John Wick, and then he turned into John Clark. Now nobody's going to be able to suspect that. Uh, a few years later, Clark does some cool action hero stuff and gets a full pardon from the U.S. president, clearing his name and honor among the armed forces and intelligence community. He continued to work as an instructor to the CIA field operatives when he noticed that even though the chances of a major international confrontation was at an all-time low, Violent terrorism was still on the rise. Wanting to curb this increase of violence, Clark wrote a memo to NATO, proposing a multinational task force that would be able to rapidly respond to incoming or ongoing threats across the globe. Thankfully, the proposal was accepted, and Rainbow was born in 1999 and headed by a newly promoted John Clark who took on the codename Six. Rainbow would operate out of the UK because, Clark reasoned, 
the UK was internationally accessible, was already a close ally to the US, and already had a heavily experienced counter-terrorist organization, the SAS. Clark saw it as the perfect candidate for Rainbow's home base. The Phoenix Group, which was a rambling anarchist group turned international terrorist establishment, was planning on releasing the Ebola virus to cause the destruction of human civilization. During Operation Winter Hawk, Rainbow identified the target of its disastrous delivery at the 2000 Sydney Olympics. It was there that Rainbow brought this scheme to an end and arrested all of Phoenix Group's major players, rendering them into the rambling bunch of radical college kids that they just were. Throughout the early 2000s, Rainbow halted nuclear and biological weapon attacks, the dispersal of a nerve gas, and an oil trade conspiracy. John Clark would retire in 2010 and leave his position to the head of Rainbow to Domingo Chavez, his close friend and protege. Shortly after, the rate of terrorism all over the world had plummeted thanks to Rainbow's efforts. Chavez believed that Rainbow's work was done, so he disbanded the unit in 2012. Unfortunately, just saying that terrorism was over was not enough, and it turned out that Rainbow was the keystone keeping the international terrorism down. Yep. Almost immediately after Rainbow was disbanded, terrorism skyrocketed. Rainbow was reactivated in 2015 by Arella Arna after the rise of the new white mask terrorist group. Their motives are unknown, and their numbers are unquantifiable. Frankly, they're just the placeholder bad guys for new players to shoot at in the terrorist hunt at the beginning of the game when they are trying to actually learn how to play because the dynamics of the game are a lot different than other first-person shooters. That is why I'm so bad at it. And a lot of other Rainbow Six games. Yes. Anyway. Following the revitalization of Rainbow, Arnott wanted more specialization within Rainbow's ranks. Among these efforts was the CBRN threat unit in 2018 that focused on biological menaces. And this came in pretty handy when the Chimera Parasite landed in New Mexico in early 2018. So this Chimera Parasite was a billion-year-old space virus that landed on Earth via an assumed lost Russian cosmonaut shuttle. It consumed the secluded town it landed in and killed most of its residents. The residents that it killed were mutated into drones that would plant sickness growths throughout the town. CBRN and Rainbow were sent in to quell the outbreak and successfully did so, destroying the central hub of the virus and cutting off its ability to reproduce. What an explosive start to a newly formed subunit. Less excitingly, though, came in the Urban Tactical Response Team that Arnott founded to streamline urban operations. She did this by pulling expertise from both Riot and Rapid Intelligence officers that could make missions in urban environments much less risky and collateral. Arnott was offered Secretary of State, holy cow, good for her, and left the position of six in 2019. She was replaced by Harry Pandy, who came in with a new approach. Pandy wanted to decentralize Rainbow and focus on individual operator capabilities, both mentally and technologically. So, of course, in the game, there's like a bunch of gadgets that all the operators have. So he wanted to focus on them. And I guess for the developers, it was like a sort of lore excuse to make a bunch of changes. He put Elena Alvarez, who is Mira, the operator in the game, in charge of Rainbow's R&D division, improving equipment across the board and smoothing out the changes in standards. To keep up with the mental maintenance of Rainbow, he created psych evaluations to keep track of each operator's state of mind. To further that goal, he insisted upon being called Harry instead of Six to maintain synergy between the entirety of Rainbow. In the midst of all this change in team cohesion, Harry creates the program. so cool just put the in front of a, a word and then all of a sudden it's so cool so the program is something that harry created as a decentralizing force relocating rainbow across the globe instead of just hereford base in the uk i mean who wouldn't want to leave the uk as soon as possible like let's be real these new bases became homes and training facilities for the operators making them a more connected unit instead of just co-workers 
one of the first facilities sprouted up at an abandoned stadium in Ellis, Greece. This is where the Tournament of Champions would take place, and the stadium, with a capital T and S, was outfitted with a state-of-the-art module kill house in the middle where the contest could be held. The tournament was open to the public and became the lore explanation for the six invitationals that Ubisoft holds every year. A rising star in the counter-terrorist world would throw a wrench into all this improvement, though. That's right. A private military company called Night Haven was recruiting specialists left and right. It was founded by Jaimini Kalimona Shah when she joined the Indian Armed Forces and became disappointed after discovering women weren't allowed in combat roles. Harry thought it would be a great idea to invite Night Haven into Rainbow's ranks. His reasoning was along the lines of making the first move before another hostile organization would. So he invited Jaimini, codenamed Kali, and a close associate of hers, codenamed Wamai. We all call him Whammy. Yeah, Whammy. Anyway, uh, this proved to be a big mistake on the part of Harry. By having an inside part in Rainbow... Jamini poached several operatives from Rainbow to join Night Haven, putting a pretty big dent in Rainbow's manpower. As of right now, Night Haven is up to no good, and they've most recently been up to some nasty murder mystery shenanigans in Japan. So this is the Rainbow Six Siege story up until sort of early to mid-2022. What we gave you here today was just the tip of the iceberg for the entire Rainbow Six Siege story. Um, this is just kind of the background of what Rainbow is. However, sometime very soon, there may be a release of very specific details for every operator that may come out on our uh, social medias. So keep an eye out for that. So it's time for the critics review by Multiplayer Vault's resident researcher and game critic, Francis. <clears throat> I think that the numerous operators in the game symbolize how we have to adapt to overcome the many challenges thrown our way throughout our lives. Sticking to the comfortable path will always be easier, but experimenting with new ways of life, or in Siege's case, operators, can unlock a hidden power deep inside all of us and allow us to live a fulfilling, satisfying life. The operator's differing ethnic backgrounds show us that anyone can change for the better. Nobody should ever be restricted by what they believe in or who they are. We all have great potential locked away. It is about finding that potential and making it a reality. Wow. So, uh, the wise words from, from Francis. I think we can all learn something from these critics' reviews. I want that on a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so that was Rainbow Six Siege. Not as long as Fortnite, but it's it's not a multiverse spanning story. So it's what we got. We'll, we'll dive into it more here in the discussion episode. So make sure to check that out. Yeah, it's a lot more of just like high school drama, especially with <laughs> the operators themselves. You know, who likes who? Who dislikes who? Who killed each other's siblings you know it's kind of that kind of stuff <laughs> but anyway thank you all for joining us for this rainbow six siege episode of multiplayer vault research for this episode was done by john ekstrom and francis audio direction was by yours truly evan Barr. if you enjoy the podcast or would like to heavily criticize us feel free to reach out you can find our socials down below or just look up airtone studios with bear spelled like a bear on instagram twitter youtube carrier pigeon any of those also make sure to give us a review on whatever your listening platform is we are doing very well i'm very happy to announce that we have all five stars on uh Apple yeah Podcasts. so hopefully yeah no more reviews um, I think there's like four reviews That's right it. now no more reviews nobody's allowed to review <laughs> stop the count um yeah but no not only will you doing that help us reach other potential listeners but it just lets us know that you enjoy our content and would like to see more once again, thank you all for tuning into our episode. I'm Sky. And I'm Evan. And this is Multiplayer Vault.